All right, can you hear me now? Yeah. All right, we give the, the straggler eater type people uh, one more minute to come in. All of you guys should have a clicker and a handout. So old technology and new technology combined at the same time. Remember to turn your cell phones off, and if it rings, I will personally answer it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'll be like that professor, I don't know if you guys read about it in the Inside Higher Education. He walked out of his class and refused to come back after someone's cell phone. Okay, oh, more people coming in, but I want to get started. Hi, my name is Debbie Ginsberg. I'm the Electronic Resources Librarian at Chicago Kent, and some of you may know my former obsession was wikis, but now I'm into social networks because Facebook is fun. So I'm going to be talking today about how we can use social networks ourselves and how we can use uh, social networks in our law schools to help promote services and resources and whatever it is we have to promote. So, this right. I've been hearing a lot of numbers out of this conference, so some of the numbers, you know, numbers are always more accurate than others. And I was reading in an article that came out last week that one in four people online are using social networks right now. So already when we're coming into a law school, we can expect that at least 25% of pretty much everybody may be, is likely to be on a social network. I've also heard some numbers, I think I saw Jamila's post on Twitter that he heard that was 80% of FSU students get on Facebook right once a week, is that right? That never sounds good to me. I went to the talk where the woman from ASU was talking, did a survey of her students, and she found that over 50% of her students were using Facebook somewhat regularly, either using it often or sometimes. Just Doing searches on MySpace for my school, Chicago Kent, showed that three, over 350 alumni had joined MySpace and had pages there. And on LinkedIn, finally, the University of Illinois has set up an alumni group for all University of Alumni group. And in the first couple weeks I was aware of it, over 500 people have joined. I can't even see more because of, I'm only got a free account. It's huge. So the numerical potential for accessing and talking and connecting with people through social networks for us in law schools seems to be fairly large. <coughs> but when we're talking about how we're dealing with social networks, there's two issues that we as law librarians, law school administrators, law professors, IP professionals, webmasters need to keep in mind. The first one I think we've heard quite a bit about, but I'm still going to discuss it, which is how we use social networks to connect with our students and others in the law school community. But we also want to keep in mind how we use social networks ourselves to portray ourselves and how we can teach our students to use social networks. They're already there, and as we know, sometimes they're there in very embarrassing ways. So we need to make sure they know how they're coming across and how they can use these networks to best present themselves professionally. But I've been talking about social network this and social network that and what is a social network and all of these things are social networks and it's quite a bit to deal with. Let's get a little more basic. I'll quote myself uh, and I wrote an article in LLX. So social networks are online applications that create links between those who have joined that application. And the links may be based on education, they may be based on where they're currently employed, past employment, expertise, areas of personal and professional interest. So the whole idea behind these social networks is creating links with other people to build on whatever it is that were, is important to us. Oops, wrong button. So, hey, I got the clickers, because clickers are fun. And I gives you a chance to let me know what you guys are already doing. So I want to know if any of you guys are social. One answer, please, on this one. How many clickers were passed out? Um, so. All right, so let's get the number of something close to 50. Um, 30. <laughs> Green light that means your answer is received. Okay. On the, on the device. So. Anyone have problems with the device? You can change your answer. 
up to last one. 10, 9, 8, and then close enough. So, there we go. Uh, so one of the, some, quite a few of you haven't joined any yet. Many of you, over half of you are really starting to join at least one to three social networks. So you're starting to explore and see what this can um, do for you in your law school. Some of you, about 14%, are really getting into it and are just in all kinds of social networks. Who's one of the people who said they were in more than seven? <laughs> <laughs> Which ones have you joined? Uh, well, LinkedIn, uh, several Ning, um, Facebook, MySpace, um, Twitter, uh, Jaiku, Pounce. <laughs> wow. So he's joined some of the big ones. The big three, LinkedIn, MySpace, Facebook. He's in the ones that push small bits of information, Pounce, Jaiku, and Twitter and Ning, which uh, forms really individual social networks. And we'll be talking about quite a few of them. Uh, and when one person says, who developed their own social network in PHP? Yeah, OK. You didn't have it. I'm antisocial up there, so I didn't know what else to choose. <laughs> I have no antisocial networks. <laughs> All right, so those of you who have joined social networks, I won't be waiting for so many responses here. Where are you? And you can pick more than one. of you guys are in Facebook, 50% of you are in LinkedIn, a few of you are in Ning, some of you are in others, and others would be things like Twitter. Is there any particularly interesting one that one of these in that I haven't mentioned so far? No, nah, I got the basics. We can see we're all over the place and we're starting to see how we ourselves present to the law school and the general audience. Now, here I'm talking about how we ourselves are in social networks, and that's what I'm talking about ourselves. Now I want to know if you've created a professional uh, page in a social network, either in Ning or a page for your law school or library or a professional group in Facebook. I'm going to say no, not yet. Okay, so at this time, even though we ourselves have joined professional networks, we haven't yet started to use them professionally. So one of the things I'm going to give you guys some ideas about is how we can use these networks to expand our professional presence and our law schools and organizations' professional presence within social networks. Someone who has created uh, something professionally, raise your hand. Facebook. What did you create? Um, school page for school. Uh, fan page. How many fans do you have? Not enough yet because we started at the end of the academic year. So right. We didn't really launch a campaign in the fall. Excellent. Thank you. I created a name site for my class. How did that work out? Well, I'm doing it right now. Um, I didn't make it mandatory, but about half of the students opted in. And I'll follow it up just with a review of what we spoke about in class. Um, it's a little bit hard because I didn't make it mandatory, so I can't give the people who join too much more uh, information than I give the other students who, who chose not to join because they're working in the summer and their firms don't let them oh, no. That's on okay. their computers. So, uh, but um, it's been good. Uh, it's just it's another communication device to reach out to my students. Excellent. So we've got Facebook pages, name groups, there are all kinds of ways that we can use these networks to <coughs> talk to people in sort of non-traditional ways. Maybe people that wouldn't normally talk to us any other way. 
So I thought I'd review the big three, even though probably most of you are generally familiar with it, but also show how some of these three are being used uh, both by individuals and by law schools and law libraries, and then start with, faith, with MySpace, since that's currently I think, the biggest one. One of the oldest social networks, it's customizable so you can make the pages kind of look like how you want, uh, but it takes some work. Uh, and it tends to attract a lot of younger people. So while when I was hearing people talk about social networks here at the conference, it seemed that most of the students are currently using Facebook. When they started talking about their teenage kids, they said, they're all on MySpace, which means that's what the next generation is going to use. I also heard one administrator say, when I was looking at the web traffic, MySpace had surpassed Google in his local law school web traffic. So it's definitely something we need to be aware of what's going on there. But when we think of MySpace, we think it's kind of a mess. Uh, this is the page for the diffuser. He's the winner of Who Wants to Be a Superhero last year. And when he first had his page, it was so unreadable, and there were songs, and it was awful. He's since improved it, but still, Jacob Nielsen has died and is rolling in his grave, because that background scrolls as you try to read it, and the text is unreadable, and it's just awful. And when we think of MySpace, we're worried, this is what our students are doing, and this is what employers are going to see complete disorganization, embarrassing stuff, but some of our students are more savvy and as they become lawyers, they become more savvy and they're starting to produce pages like this. All right, she calls herself Legally Blonde PA, eh, but she <laughs> set herself up on MySpace as a bankruptcy expert. Not a bad idea when dealing with musicians. She has articles that demonstrate her area of expertise. She's the number one hit if you search for lawyer MySpace. She could update it more often. She hasn't updated since January. But this um, audio file is an interview that she did on the radio because she had created a page in MySpace and was starting to generate publicity for herself and her business. This is something she can do for free. It doesn't take a lot of expertise. And it might be something our students start doing to showcase themselves publicly on the web in something that doesn't take the kind of programming expertise that HTML takes. In addition, we ourselves are starting to use MySpace to showcase ourselves. Is Harvey here today? Oh, there you are. Sorry, I've been talking to you this whole time. You want to talk about your space here on MySpace? Well, you'll notice that I'm a 25-year-old female, or the li library is a 25-year-old female. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the some of, the, some of, the, some of the, the, the fields are required, and, and I, I took the... The yeah. average. Well, no, I, the average. <laughs> uh, no, I took when the building was built, and, and when the library was actually created. And the, the word for, for library in German, in, which is my first language, is... is Feminine, so I made the library uh, a girl. A girl. Uh, <laughs> 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 word, word for girl in German is neutral. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and then I, I've sometimes I've recreated things from our blog onto the blog for, for the library homepage, and I've. Um, what, one of the big things for us during exam time is how to use the exam software. I created a YouTube video that I've then embedded on our page. Um, and I, I, I found other things that students might be interested in and I've put that on the page. I've interacted with students, shot them bulletins. And I was the one that, that, that Denver was referring to earlier that uh, was talking to our network guy uh, when he mentioned that MySpace had passed Google and, and we were having problems connecting with our students uh, using their, their university uh, emails, which nobody was, was checking. And so I thought this would be a cool way of uh, connecting with our students. And it's, I have 80 some law student friends. Great, so he's been really using this page to connect with students in a way that is not otherwise possible in a way that they're prepared to listen to far more readily than all of the university emails. That's another complaint I've heard constantly. Thanks, for That was excellent. And it really showcases how you can use something like a MySpace page to connect in a way that maybe, finally, our students will actually listen to. Not all of them, but at least some are starting to. 
However, as the numbers showed when we were clicking ourselves, traditionally law schools tend to be more in Facebook. It was originally set up for students at Harvard to be a kind of yearbook. They expanded it to other Ivy Leagues. Then they expanded it to anyone in academia. And finally, anyone could get a Facebook page. For a while, unlike MySpace, which I think is one of the reasons Harvey chose it, 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 Facebook would kick out libraries and law schools who tried to set up their own pages within Facebook. Since then, they've opened it up and actually created a, a, a application specifically for that. MySpace, you get to change around a little bit, so I saw that Harvey had changed his uh, background and, and the way everything was laid out over time. Facebook pages tend to be a lot more static, so you don't get so much control over them. But as I was uh, suggesting before, you can be pretty sure to a good extent your students have Facebook pages and many of them are checking them regularly. Facebook pages, however, like MySpace, can be a bit of a mess. And here's mine to show that, yes, it's a huge mess. And the way uh, Facebook's page gets to be a mess, unlike MySpace, instead of just adding all these audio files, is I can add all these neat applications. I like playing with them all. So, so that's one thing we'll want our students to be aware of. When you have a Facebook page, you don't have to install every application <coughs> in existence and how to, to manage those applications so it's not so messy. But one other thing Facebook allows is allows you to create groups. There are groups in MySpace. I think John Marshall has one for Criminal Law Society, but it doesn't work the same way a Facebook group works. In a Facebook group, you can join it and then see who the other members are and connect to them that way. You can have forum discussions, uh, discuss events, post links, and other interesting materials. And there, also, you can let the other people know who are on Facebook, what groups you're part of, and then they are likely to join them too. So these groups I've listed here are typical ones that are available just for law librarians and those who are interested in using Facebook in academia. You can see with the librarians ones, they feature many cats, because cats are important to librarians. <laughs> I even found a Facebook for people who don't like cheese. Those who know me pretty well know that uh, my big question at these conferences is, does that have cheese in it? And there's like 80 other people on Facebook who don't like cheese. So uh, first thing I found was that. So how many people actually have a, a Facebook page for their library or law school? you guys don't have a Facebook page. I'm interested that there's 12 people who don't know. <laughs> which means that we, as we get Facebook pages, we'll start to make, one of the things that as, uh, Christine said, we're going to have to make sure we publicize them so that answer will go down. <laughs> who here has a, face, a page for their law school? I know that there's a list of law libraries. So easier to find. Who said it? said yes for their law school? Did you make it? No, our public communications office made it. What kind of things do they put on it? <laughs> the kind of things public communications office want to say about school. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's brochureware type stuff. Brochureware, and it's easy to use for the most part. Yeah. Uh, so this is the Chicago Kent, or IIT downtown campus library. Chicago Kent uh, shares a library with the business school, so we have to have a broader aim for the library. And what a typical Facebook page looks like. And a Facebook page is the application that Facebook created so that schools, libraries, other institutions could have spaces within Facebook that would showcase the kind of information that they or their uh, public people wanted to make sure everybody knows. So this is the one that you can see for Chicago Kent. And uh, I, I really didn't create it last week. OK, I did. Um, <laughs> but it has all the things that we want to showcase. So we have six fans. So that, and as that grows, I'll start to see who of our students are fans. And I'll know that I can push information to them. What our hours are, because that's the number one question. Well, number two, number one is where's the bathroom. <laughs> We've got a thing that hooks up to our internal, our 
chat, so anyone who has a reference question can even ask it from the, our page. JSTOR search, we have a WorldCat search, and one of my favorite things is we can push all the information from our library web blogs to Facebook, making it that much more likely that anyone who checks Facebook regularly is going to see some of the information the library has to share. This took about an hour to set up. It was pretty easy, and it looked, um, and it'll be pretty easy to maintain. Did you have a question? Yeah, if you don't mind me interrupting. I was looking at Dukes, and I don't okay. know anything about this stuff. I'll just put that okay. there. And it looks as if they're putting, like, through their access file, all their, say, legal databases and links. How easy it, so I'm looking at BNA, JSTOR, some other stuff. Cool. How easy is it I mean, are, are you, to get those to work through Facebook? Um, I, if, the, if the application already exists, like the JSTOR one, right. really easy. I just say, install JSTOR, here's my proxy server heading, and go. If I have to make it myself, it's a little harder. I, I have an advantage at IIT that some of you guys don't have, which is I can hire the grad students who have five years of program experience and say, program for me. So I haven't made one personally. Has anyone here made one of the, of the searches personally yet? All right, how, how easy was it? Um, I took somebody else's search and just basically modified. It was pretty easy. <laughs> so, <laughs> it works. Yes. What was your search for? Um, library catalog. And that's a, a one common thing you'll see. I'll, I'll show you some examples. A lot of people have created ones for their library catalog. We haven't done that yet, but it's in the plan. And uh, as one of the things, of course, is we're not alone. I'll talk a little bit more about this Ning network that the law librarians have set up for themselves, and they are creating a list of all the law librarians who are on Facebook. And I'll also suggest that we create one for all law schools that are on Facebook, so we can start to compare and contrast what might be different from a library page versus a law school page. Does anyone uh, have a library who hasn't done this, isn't on this list yet? Am I on this list? So you want to join the Ning group and put your name up here. Traditionally, the way that larger groups, law firms, law schools, and other institutions had communicated through Facebook was something called a network. And the network would allow, when you join Facebook, you were usually assigned a network. So I joined with my undergrad alumni ID because I wanted to join before Facebook had opened up. And so I was put into the Brown University network. Then later I joined the Chicago network, but I didn't want to join the Chicago Kent network initially because I noticed that the students were using it to communicate among themselves. They had, say, a page of fan art for their favorite professor, or they might be making fun of something, and I wanted to make sure that they had that space for themselves. <coughs> Law firms have been using networks, too, in a really interesting way. They will have very close networks where current associates and current partners may be members, they may bring in their summer associates, and they use it to connect to law firm alumni. And I thought that was a really interesting way to sort of have a, a fun place for the law firm to uh, connect to each other, especially alumni who might want to keep up on firm events and happenings. So it's, a, it's an easy way for law firms to provide that kind of information. Um, but as you can see here, networks are going away. I'm, I'm not quite sure why. Uh, they seem to be kind of duplicative with the groups that I mentioned earlier, and I think that's what they want to replace it with. But anyone who's been sort of using the law school networks to communicate with those uh, Facebook users who have their law school's address will need to be aware of that. <coughs> what I think it's being gonna, one of the ways a law school can re replace it is with a law school page. And yet, yeah, this is kind of the brochure like page from the University of Chicago. And it lets them in a more public way, showcase their events, photos from events, uh, building information and information about the law school itself in a way that's easy for the administrators of this page to maintain. So, you know, they have RSS from their podcasts and their blogs and all kinds of things here, so anyone who wants to know more information about the University of Chicago, whether they're currently associated with them or not, can come to this Facebook page and take a look at it. Does anyone else have a law school Facebook page? You said you said one. Anyone else? Not yet. Just the library so far. Now, Facebook and MySpace aren't traditionally set up so that 
something like a law school or a law library can communicate with other people. It's not meant to be a professional place. It's meant to be a fun place. LinkedIn is a little bit different, and I think 50% of you are, are, have already joined LinkedIn. And we're finding that it's a great place for professionals to connect to other professionals. Like, actually more so than Facebook, the pages are very static. You can only just put up the information that they, they let you put up. And unlike Facebook and MySpace, there are paid accounts within LinkedIn. Does anyone have a paid account in LinkedIn? I don't think a lot of law people are using them. So again, my page in LinkedIn because I can get to it. And you can see it looks kind of like a resume. And this will be the kind of thing that our students will want to do as they start to showcase their professional credentials. And we'll have to show them how to set something up like this up so that they can start to connect to each other and connect to others to find jobs and to find others with certain professional expertise that they don't have. Lawyers like to use this because they may practice immigration law and their client comes in with a traffic question and now they want to know who can help that client. And the way they do it is through connections. In MySpace, in Facebook, you have sort of uh, one level of connection, you can connect to anyone you're connected with. LinkedIn sp expands it a little bit. So we have first level connections, and this is part of my list of first level connections. People who I say, I want to connect to you, and they say to me, I want to connect to you back. And you can see some of them have many different connections, and other people, uh, this is obviously Jim, uh, <laughs> Buffalo, have like 300. And if I need to, you know, let's say I need to contact a library in Buffalo, I know exactly who I need to contact. So apparently you can hear me better here. Um, beyond this, it, I have a second level connection to the people that they have connections with. So that's the next level. And there's a third level, the people who the second level have connections with. So I can really start to see how my, well, the whole community that surrounds me and surrounds the other people I know how it all fits together, where different areas of expertise are, and you know, where things that might be surprising. So one of the names on my list is a paleontologist. So if suddenly some um, needed to talk to the paleontologist at the Smithsonian, they would know, oh, I can contact Debbie, and maybe she can help me reach that person. Beyond that, there's people out of your network, though, and they're a lot harder to contact within LinkedIn. LinkedIn has recently expanded how users can connect to one another within groups. The groups are usually focused around being an alumni or associated with a particular university or organization. And it gives you a chance to sort of reach more members than you would otherwise be able to reach just through your contacts. Has anyone in it, uh, has anyone created a LinkedIn group? Is anyone in a LinkedIn group? What group are you in? How many members do you have? Okay. And you? Yeah, the Law Librarians Group. The Law Librarians Group. And that's one that just joined and now it's got a couple hundred people. It's really getting big. So you can see they can be for specific things or for something nebulous as law librarians. What I'm finding though, this is actually true across all Facebook or all Facebook, all social networks, is it's kind of hard to search. So when looking for particular people in LinkedIn or in Facebook or MySpace, it's, it can be kind of difficult to find exactly what you want. And even looking for groups, you can say, we don't have a directory yet. Why have groups and not have a directory? It's a bit challenging to find the groups that are most relevant to you. So one of the things I put on the handout is a Google search someone created to search the groups. Everything can be kludge. Your students and, and us can, will use this in lots of different ways. One of the ways that you can use LinkedIn is to get company information. And you'd be surprised to find the level of group information that's available. What they'll be interested if they're looking at information for, say, a law firm, is who in their network is connected to that law firm. Here I'm looking at Chicago Kent. I can find all kinds of weird information. I can find my connections, which is fine. But I, can't, I can also find new hires. That's a little personal. I can find the most connected people, the most contacted people within the, the network. That seems a little personal, too. And some basic information about how Chicago Kent fits in within the rest of the LinkedIn network. 
but kind of scary information from my perspective, but your students are going to find that kind of information useful when they start to look for jobs. The other thing I like is that this is something that the members can use to ask for and seek advice on all kinds of different topics. Uh, does anyone use Ask Metafilter? Or any kind of Ask type of thing? It's like this, but tends to, like, it's like the more informal asking sites on the net, but is geared towards experts. And here's typical questions that someone might ask about libraries, and someone wanted to know what was the best uh, information for a place for, to go for collection building for law libraries, for example. Another big thing everyone's interested in, jobs. They're not library jobs. But I think this is something that we'll see uh, expand over the next few years. And our students are going to start to look for jobs here. And this is going to be where employers expect people to go to uh, look at job announcements, to get hired. And they're going to expect the LinkedIn profiles to look in a particular way. So that's what part of our teaching process to make sure that not just our profiles, but our students' profiles are really tight. And a lot of them are looking for the little thumbs up, which means you can recommend it. They were looking for recommendations. So not only in LinkedIn do we have an idea of how we're all connecting, but we're building reputations. You can build reputations through working with other people and they recommend you. You can build reputations on that answer site by providing really solid answers on your areas of expertise and expand, establish your areas of expertise in the LinkedIn network. LinkedIn does offer paid accounts, mostly used by job seekers and employers to reach more potential uh, applicants and job positions. <clears throat> Now, the social networks I've been talking about so far are fairly broad. They're meant for anyone who joins to start to connect with the entire social network that's within that particular application. You join Facebook, and now you're part of a full Facebook uh, community. You join MySpace, and you're part of that community. You start to get uh, emails regularly from the guy who created MySpace. On LinkedIn, you start to get updates about what's going on in that whole community. Ning, on the other hand, is a different kind of social network. And Ning is intended to create small social networks, like Vicki is using for her class, where the people who join are basically just working with each other. So you get the same kinds of services and resources that you might find in a social network, forums and, and places to post photos and ways to promote events, but only within the people who are part of that network. The law librarians have created their own name network. Who here is a law librarian? OK. So this network is for you, uh, anyone who's interested in law libraries in general. And they, we're, we've been using it to have discussions about social networks and other Web 2.0 applications. We have a forum for those kinds of discussions. Events are being, like AA, double L are being discussed on the Ning network. We have the page, like I showed you before, that is showing the kinds of web 2.0 resources law librarians are creating for their libraries. And we even have subgroups for particular kinds of law librarians, say a solo librarian or a firm librarian, all of which are encouraged to join this group and be an active part of it. The more active we can be, the more we're going to get done. Who here is part of the Ning network? And who here has done something active in it? <laughs> <laughs> you can see part of the problem we sometimes get with me. But we encourage you uh, as we start to develop more to become more active and hopefully share some of the things you guys learned at the conference here at this website. And as Vicki said, this is also a great place for classes to connect and uh, you know, any sort of small social group. Some people use it for families or for um, other kinds of interests. One thing I wanted to say about it, um, they're able to password your networks. So uh, that was a consideration for me because I only want my students on my little network. And I think that's a really good feature. And you can make them answer questions in order to join your social networks. And they're required to write a paper this summer. Um, and they had to give me their paper topic before they were allowed to join. Wow. <laughs> so Vicki has password protected her name site so only her class people can join and even made them 
answer questions before <laughs> about their paper topic before they could join. And you had a question? Yes? She, she asked the same question. Okay, okay, great. Um, one other thing, and I guess this is true for anything on the internet, uh, anyone seen Avenue Q? The internet is for? Porn. Porn. And Ning is for that too. Uh, there was a big controversy back in January uh, that some schools were very uncomfortable using Ning because they had a very open policy. And so some of the groups, I'll just say, are more specialized than other groups. Uh, <laughs> I haven't had that problem. I haven't seen anything because it's such a uh, closed group that I'm dealing with. And you know, even my searches for groups having to do with law schools and law libraries didn't come across anything, but just be aware. Now there are, well, there are all these great social networks and they can do a lot for us and they can do a lot for our students. There are certain things that we need to teach ourselves about social networks and need to make sure our students understand as they start to be part of it. One of TMI, too much information. Uh, this is my little profile within Facebook, and the more information I find, or more information I put up, the more opportunity I have to connect with other people in Facebook. Everything I put up is my interest, cure, 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 and more cure after that. That becomes a link that lets me connect to other users. <coughs> but that's a lot of information for anyone who accesses my Facebook to see. And I've got to start thinking, and our students have to start thinking about <coughs> And what joining social networks means for their privacy. Um, the more information I reveal my, about myself, the more opportunity I have to connect with people like me and be social. But the more information I reveal about myself, the more information there is for people to know that sometimes gets uncomfortable. Now some let, networks let me control the kinds of information that I can put out. Some people will see some kinds of information. Other people will not see that, depending on how it's set, get it set up. But setting up privacy controls is cumbersome and hard and, you know, just imagine your professors and your students go through that level of setup. Not likely. They're just going to expose everything and they need to be aware that's happening. We've seen issues of what goes on the net stays on the net. So you know, your students um, or maybe even incoming professors may have put something up back in, say, 2005 and they think they can take it down now. But that photograph of them with the, you know, the bong and the beer kegs at the age of 19, the little things say 19 forever, it's not just on their site, it's on all their friends' sites, it's identifying them, and they can't make it go away as easily as they think. Uh, and some social networks have questionable privacy policies. Uh, there's an issue where, I think was it a law school in Canada, had been looking at Facebook's privacy policy and found that it actually violated some laws. And sometimes they say things are private which are not, and it's not very clear. Anyone run into any issues with this so far? Well, it's not so much issues, but we are starting to, in orientation, start telling law students to pull their sites down and clean them up and because they're being examined by job, you know, for Bar examiner. Yeah, bar examiners and everybody else. And so we're just putting it out and when they come into law school to they better think about it, they better act like professionals, they better clean up what they have, although there's going to be stuff out there and, and think about dealing with it now. So that's become part of your orientation process. Not only being oriented to law school, but they're ori being oriented to what's going to be expected of their professional presence on the net as they go forward. Now, on Facebook, everybody can have a page, even cats. Uh, so this is my cat's cat book page on Facebook. Her name is Tangerine, and here she is with her little mat. Oh, 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 Tangerine's been sniffing the catnip, and uh, she's doing all these other things. She's having a really good time, which brings up some of the legal uh, issues that we tend to face on these social network sites. Things that come up again and again, who owns what we put up there. There are a lot of people who don't want to use social network sites like Flickr or Facebook or other kinds of media. They don't want to put their media and their information and their photos up there because they're not clear who owns them or who has what rights to them. So one issue that was uh, came up in Facebook when after I first joined is um, one of my friends who's a mom found that if she put up pictures of her baby face in, that was private, Facebook said, well, I can do whatever I want to with these pictures and even make them public. And that was something that really upset her, and she took her pictures down. And that's something that if we're putting up law school pictures, we have to be aware 
that there is some issues about ownership and rights. And if we put up a picture of our law school, we shouldn't be surprised maybe to find it someplace else in Facebook later. Uh, there's a question of who's legally liable for what we say in, face in Facebook and other networks. Is the network liable or are we liable? So when I accuse my cat of sniffing that catnip, is Tangerine going to sue me or is she going to sue Facebook? Well, if she sues me, she's not getting any more gushy food, so I assume she'll go after Facebook. Who's responsible for copyright violations, especially in places like MySpace where people are putting up a lot of different music is something we've heard a lot. And when I did a similar talk to this for the Chicago Association of Law Librarians, there were a lot of law firm librarians there who immediately pointed out they love social networks. That's where they find evidence. <coughs> All kinds of evidence, not just the embarrassing photographs. Not just, hey, he had, she admitted to sniffing catnip right on her Facebook page. No, they get contact information that's otherwise difficult to get. They, you know, they get quotes out of context, all kinds of things that they like to use for uh, being a lawyer. So part of the cleaning up that we want to emphasize for students is, you know, would you want this appearing in a court case? Has anyone had any experience with this? Or? Not yet. Just the law firm library. It's too bad we can't get it. Wasn't there the, the kid, and I know it was Facebook, but the law student from some Northeast thing, Northeast, <coughs> lost a job because of the... Oh, that's audio admit, right? Oh, that's the... That, the whole... The forum Yes, yeah, okay. I mean, so yeah. they found him. They had a job offer down here at a pretty decent firm, and from what happened on the, the net, and I guess it wasn't Facebook or anything, but they pulled the job offer. Yeah, that's the guy who, was, who let the yes. forum go off where people could say really horrible things and, and scary things about other law students. And he said, I, I, I'm not responsible for what they say. And, law students, and the law firm said, we're not responsible for hiring you then. So there are consequences, not just on social networks, but on the students' general net presence that they need to be aware of. Uh, another legal issue that's come up when we do applications, who really has uh, the rights to this. So who here is a Scrabulous player? A couple of people here. Scrabulous, you can see, looks kind of familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> so that, yeah. Scrabble's not very happy with Scrabulous, and every few months I, I get told on the various blogs that Scrabulous is about to be taken down, Scrabble's had enough, uh, and yet it just keeps developing more players. So here I'm playing with another law librarian, Paula, and at this moment I'm winning, but I think in the actual game I'm not. Uh, but that brings up the issues not just of legal, but where are the boundaries between personal and professional? That's another thing that's part of privacy, but another thing that we have to teach ourselves and our students. Some people really like to keep these separately. They may have two accounts, one for their professional space and one for their personal space. Some people like, really like to combine them, and they don't have an issue with presenting a lot of personal information, professional information in the same space. And that just has to be a consideration of just what the person is doing is comfortable with and something our students are going to have to consider as they work with these sites. And unfortunately, the sites themselves aren't set up for us to do that, even the professional ones. So I was talking to the head of career services for our business school, and she has a LinkedIn site. She really likes LinkedIn, and she likes our students to be on LinkedIn to promote their professional presence. But her students want to be linked to her. And the reason why the students want to be linked to the head of career services is because she has all those great contacts. Well, she doesn't want to provide those contacts to her students because they would be abused. So she needs to keep that separate. Now, it would be nice for her students and it would help them establish legitimacy if she could be their contact. But because she can't have a list of contacts that one of uh, parts of her uh, network can see and a list of contacts that another part of her network can see, she just has to deny them outright. It's a kind of an issue. Um, but at the same time, although it's great issues for us to consider, remember these are social networks, and they're meant for us to be social with each other. So while, of course, we want to use them professionally, and we're only going to discuss topics of utmost importance, uh, is another way for us to start to communicate with us, ourselves and break down some barriers in ways that you know, we don't traditionally do. Traditionally, of course, we would do this on a golf course, but who here plays golf? <laughs> yeah. Uh, who here plays games? A few more of you. So 
we, I can use my, uh, the online games like Scrabulous to start to really connect to other librarians and other lawyers and other people in law schools in a sort of informal setting. And then when we're in places like conferences like this, we can really connect and discuss issues. So is anyone going to join me for some Scrabulous? <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one. Oh, you're going to need a third category. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> I'm just that competitive. No, of course you're going to beat me, but we're going to have fun and, and you know, start to really connect. Now, we've already been talking quite a bit at this conference about how we as institutions are going to use these networks to reach our students. So we've talked about a few about these in this session already, but just to reiterate, these social networks will let us go where our students already are. We saw some of the num num numbers at the beginning of this talk, and there's good evidence that this is where our students are, and if we go there, it's going to give us a chance to connect up to them in ways that we haven't been able to already, in ways that they're prepared to listen to, as opposed to their university email. We'll start to see how our community is connected, sometimes in really unexpected ways. We might see a group of students who are connected in a particular way. We don't want to be creepy about it, but if it's obvious, we can start to say, oh, you guys all have the same interest. Maybe you want to form a group. Let me help you. We'll find untapped areas of expertise. Oh, Debbie, I didn't know you know the person who ghostwrites the Pirates of Caribbean novels, and for some reason I need to deal with, uh, I, I, I need this for some social, because I want to include this in my law and popular culture collection. Now we can talk. Um, it gives us a chance to introduce new resources to our communities in ways that they might not see otherwise. We get to experiment with new technologies, and we get to have fun. We get, like you did, to you take someone else's widget and make it our own. We get to play Scrabulous. We get to talk with our friends and you know, sort of play around and say, hey, I'm working. <laughs> <laughs> but as much as I like social networks and much as I'm very enthusiastic about them, they're not panaceas. They're, they're not going to do everything for us. They will they still exclude many faculty, students, and staff. For example, how many of our, us think we have lots of professors on Facebook? Not yet. They're not meant to replace websites. I think there's some companies who think, oh, I'll just put up a Facebook page and that'll be it. And we've got to at least be aware that at some point, someone's going to come out from behind and say, why do we need a website? We can just be on social networks and that'll do it. But we've seen that social networks are fairly limited and we're going to continue to need to do the same things we're doing before, which means now we have to be working in more places. Uh, our ability to customize them are often limited, so someone's going to go, this Facebook page isn't branded correctly, and there's nothing we can do about it. And that's going to be a fight that we're going to have to have with you know, people who aren't as familiar with it. And once we set up something, it's going to, just like any website, it's something we're going to have to keep maintaining, keep up to date, keep an eye on in order for, uh, for it to remain relevant. It's not just enough to put up a Facebook page but we'll have to add new services, remove services that are outdated, and make sure all the information there is up to date. So, um, for those of you who are planning on doing things, I think this was gone over one of the sessions here already, if you're planning on creating a social network space for your library, your law school, or professional group, you'll have to consider the, the same things you would for pretty much any kind of website. You want to know who you plan to reach, so understand what audiences a social network can reach and what they won't. What information is most important because customization is limited, because you only have a small amount of space, you will have to keep that in mind. You'll have to decide who's going to administer the website and then who's going to be responsible for helping support the website. I can see you know, the IT folks are going, not something else I need to support. I've already got so much to do. And the law librarians are saying, let me go play with it right now. Um, and the public administrator is saying, no, you don't have the right information. All of these groups are going to have to be in, uh, combined, working together to make the best pages. You also decide how much time and money are reasonable and uh, how much uh, you're willing to put into it. This is something that should have low cost, low time, and it starts to get high, then it's probably not worth it. You're not going to reach enough people. 
You'll have to understand what features are available and what aren't, and you'll have to pick and choose. You don't want, maybe like Boot does, every single possible resource because that will clutter your page. So it's going to require a lot of editing. And if it's not working, you'll want an exit plan. How am I going to get out of this? How am I going to tear this, down, this uh, page down if it's not working as I planned? So is anyone planning to do a page? discussions about this and frankly some of our um, senior administration are terrified um, that we'll put up a page that is uh, associated with Emory and then becomes filled with comments that then wind up on above the wall mm. and uh, they point. it's a it's actually a really interesting point because we do periodically wind up in places we'd rather not be and um, it's not as much a concern for me I'm not IT director but um, but it is a concern for institutions, uh, uh, especially your branding people, your marketing people, the people who are sort of custodians of the, the image you're trying to convey. Right. You know, and, and I think the institutions have those issues. Well, sort of, I'm sorry. To sort of address that, I, I actually work in public relations as the webmaster for the school. And um, my way of selling it to them was I'm there and I'm watching. And it's also a way of sort of like owning your online reputation so that we can't actually right. face up to criticisms or misinformation that's floating about the program, about the school, what students are feeling. And I've got student, our student uh, dean of student affairs involved as well, career services involved as well. So I'm trying to get buy-in from administration as well. And what institution are you at? University of Buffalo. So what the, the problem is, is you know, once you have something like a social network up there, it becomes a place for people to connect to you and possibly say nasty things on your social network site. Uh, but uh, you've reassured uh, the people at Buffalo that you're watching, you're keeping an eye on it, so it, it's still a problem, but it's not just out there like an uncontrolled blog. Yes? You then, the person behind you. Uh, we're just getting ready to roll out a school-wide portal. Small. I don't know how many people here have school life portals already, but I see a risk of dilution here in portal, right? I mean, there's one of the keys to having a successful portal, portal is generating enough content to create a critical mass, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you've got one thing that I would think schools would have to watch out for is how to keep that critical mass in the spot you want it to be when you have so many cooks out there to soup. Right. So the issue then is if your law school says we want our audience to come here to get the information, if we're sending them elsewhere, they don't know where to go. At the same time, if your audience says we want to be over here, I'm not sure how much control you have over it. All right, one more question on this topic. In the, uh, a choice in the previous uh, slide, one of the questions you, you asked was uh, to think about yeah, how much time and money are reasonable. From those who had the experience, how much time and money, or what's the money for? And I can, I can see, you know, the time um, that you need to invest. The time, time is money. What? Or time is money, and if you're going to buy a LinkedIn well, account, it's or not other account. stuff that you need. Yeah. Okay. So how much time are you spending those of you who are working pages? I'm, I'm in it personally. And so I just pop over, take a look at it. It's not a lot of time at all. And like I said, right now, it really hasn't taken off to the point that I would like. And we'll see. Ask me in a year. And I'm going to walk this really quickly because I'm running out of time. But to set up, a face, uh, set up a Facebook page is pretty simple. You create a page. You put in your basic information like ours. This is for a law library. You add some advanced information. It's two boxes. It's not really that advanced. You remove things you don't need. Uh, there's a photo application. If I'm going to use Flickr instead, I remove the Facebook's photo application. You can search for widgets. So they'll mention library catalog search sites. And here's ones that people have come up with already. And you can add them. Uh, you can decide who your moderators are going to be. You yourself don't have to be the only ones who moderate the page. You can share that responsibility with other people. 
and then you can publish it. So here's the typical cat library on a typical cat page, and I publish it simply by clicking publish this page. A lot easier than uploading to some websites. Um, one last question. Can you hear me now? And if so, where? Websites like this is Ego uh, social bookmark site, which recently added a friends capability, so you can not sh just share social uh, bookmarks with the world at large, but specifically with your friends in Digo. There is Google Open Social, which is making it easier for people to create widgets for some of the social networks like MySpace. Uh, I've mentioned many social networks, and we're starting to want to tune in and consolidate uh, and trying to get everything at once, but there's no great way to do this. Even friend feed, which lets me get feeds from many of our social networks, isn't perfect. But the one I wanted to sort of emphasize at the end is social networks are starting to be everywhere, including those of us who have the smartphones. Uh, this is what the interface looks like for the iPhone. Again, this is what it looks like on a Mac. But I, there is a Facebook interface for iPhones. And this becomes a way for us to more easily create a web presence that can be used on a smartphone, on an internet-based phone, than we can do ourselves. Has anyone made an internet uh, site for their law school or law library that can be read easily on a Trio or an iPhone or some other internet device? One of you. Uh, if you create a Facebook page, you have. And now they have some place to get really basic. I need the hours. Oh, I can bring it up on my iPhone, and it's right there. They don't have to be trying to punch it into a site that's just not meant to be read on one of these because we don't have the programming time or expertise to create something like this. Last question. Talking about these social networks, it's part of Web 2.0. For those of you who are law librarians, AAAL, through the Computing Services Special Interest section, is going to be doing the Web 2.0 Challenge. And in this, it's going to be a five-week online course where you'll get to not just use hands-on social networks, but other things like RSS, wikis, Second Life, and we'll explain how you can promote these applications in your library. Anyone up for it? And meanwhile, take questions in the last minute. Anyone got any so exciting social network plans that you want to share with everyone else? Or Jim? Uh, I just want to mention, um, I, I set up a, a, a BOF group at uh, 1030 on social networking in 402A. So if anyone wants to continue this discussion, we can do that there, maybe. Okay, I'm going to be post, I've posted the handout on the wiki, I'll post the slides on the wiki, and uh, any further information uh, we can discuss there too. You know, that's 10 o'clock, I think you guys are ready to go. Thank you very much. Uh, yes.